Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. That's a bad thing for democracy. We've got that story plus Patreon imperiled. But first, your medical martial law updates. We will begin with some of the latest news pretty much all breaking today as we were taping this. Beginning with Max Blumenthal from the Gray Zone pointing out Gilead, which if you don't know that name, you probably should. And if you don't, you probably will soon. They're going to charge most U.S. patients $3,120 per course or $520 per vial of the COVID-19 treatment remdesivir. U.S. taxpayers, of course, subsidized much of that drug's development costs. So which leads to this article from Reuters. State attorneys general urge U.S. to let other firms make Gilead COVID-19 treatment. A bipartisan group of state attorneys general urged the U.S. government on Tuesday to allow other companies to make Gilead Sciences COVID-19 treatment remdesivir to increase its availability and lower the price of the antiviral drug. The coalition of more than 30 state attorneys general called on the government to act or allow states to do so saying in a letter to U.S. health agencies that Gilead has not established a reasonable price for remdesivir. Gilead should not profit from the pandemic, and it should be pushed to do more to help people, the letter said. And of course, remember, all oh, we've had these stories in the past of, you know, jacking up the prices of, of these medical treatments, essentially a monopoly. The other scamdemic update coming very recently, red flags soar as Big Pharma no surprise. They've they've had this for some, what, 34 years, I believe. So they're going to continue to have it moving forward. Big Pharma will be exempt for vaccine liability claims. AstraZeneca has been granted protection from future product liability claims related to its COVID-19 vaccine, hopeful by most of the countries with which it has struck supply agreements. It's a tough uh, sentence there, but that's basically a senior executive of AstraZeneca going to, of course, the important news media of the possibly Rothschild-controlled Reuters. The thing is, they won't tell you which countries they've made all these deals with. 25 companies to test their vaccine candidates on humans, getting ready to immunize hundreds of millions of people once the products are shown to work. The question of who pays for any claims for damages in case they don't work so well. Side effects. Tricky point in supply negotiations. This is a unique situation where we as a company simply cannot take the risk if in four years the vaccine is showing side effects, says Rude Dauber, a member of Astra's senior executive team. Again, talking straight to Reuters. EU officials told Reuters this week product liability was among contentious points in European efforts to secure supply deals for potential COVID-19 vaccines from Pfizer, Sanofi, and Johnson & Johnson. To put it plainly, like I saw it on the tweets, AstraZeneca, big pharma company that of course have covered up study results of their damaging products in the past, they're going to be exempt from their possible damaging products in the future. James, I wish I could say any of this was a surprise it is it's it's more of the same and it's just it's again we have these moments in this medical martial law where it just the clarity of it all hits and it's pretty sad right you're right in some ways that's the point of a story like this i know what this story is about and what it means and you i know you know what this story is about and what it means and i know that the vast majority of our regular audience understands this story and what it means but in the interest, then, of taking this information and trying to use it to wake people up who aren't awake yet or are still uh, influenced by the, you know, Reddit trendies and social media bots that uh, have convinced them that anyone who dares question the vaccine manufacturers is a crazy conspiracy theorist, how do we use a story like this? And one way that you might want to introduce this to one of your normie friends would be to say, hey, did you hear the oil companies have just been given complete carte blanche immunity for any environmental damage that their products cause in the future? It's That's crazy. Doesn't that, out, isn't that outrageous? Doesn't that make you angry? Oh, wait, did I say oil companies, environmental damage? Ah, sorry, I meant vaccine manufacturers and health damage. Ah, I always get those confused. But since it's vaccine manufacturers, that's perfectly okay, right? 
And anyone who is rational and being honest with themselves, which admittedly is a smaller and smaller percentage of the population these days, but anyone with two brain cells to rub together will be able to see uh, uh, that, yes, they're holding double standards. There is a cognitive dissonance. Yes, I understand cog uh, corporate malfeasance, and I, I'm, I'm very distrustful of the corporate you know, profit motive and all of this in these areas, but in this area... Uh, they're totally fine. And anyone who questions them is a conspiracy theorist. Anyone who won't look at that cognitive dissonance and have a moment of realization is not being honest with themselves and is not, frankly, not worth your time trying to intervene any further. So I think that's one way we can take a story like this and introduce it a little bit creatively to the normies in your life to hopefully get them to see uh, the bigger picture here. That's that's pretty fantastic. Yeah, I think I've joked recently just in the the just nutball coronavirus era having fun with stories that seem like satire but they're real and stories that seem real that turn out to be satire. It's all sort of you could probably easily text a normie friend with that. And again, it's a lot like it's a little trolly, but I think that's that's why memes work, James. We'll include one other related, which hopefully folks, after they maybe get the little glint of wondering what's going on, wonder, hey, this of course didn't start last week. This has deeper roots. And just some of those roots go back to what we've talked about here before, Dark Winter. That would be, of course, those series of essentially pharma terror drills in the months leading up to 9-11. All roads lead to Dark Winter. Whitney Webb has a fantastic piece posted a couple of months ago, or maybe several weeks back, but it's basically Fort Detrick, Gilead, 9-11, anthrax attacks. It's all the folks involved in all of that back yet again. What a surprise. We are really going to change gears, though, for the rest of this New World Next Week, episode 417. James, I'm really actually glad you shared this story to me. This was very much news to me. Patreon's ban of comic Owen Benjamin could cost them $20 million and possibly everything else. Patreon, if you didn't know, a fan funding platform, lost in court and now must arbitrate 72 individual cases from former patrons, backers, supporters of comedian Owen Benjamin after Patreon banned Owen Benjamin for hate speech. This, I, I assume, James, pretty much was all going on in the late 2018 mega Patreon purge. When Patreon, of course, what they failed to anticipate in rushing to basically do what the big boys and the, and the fangsters tell them to do, what they failed to anticipate is that according to their own terms of service, which I'm sure none of us actually read, Benjamin's fans could file arbitration claims against the company for disrupting their economic relationship with him. When Benjamin encouraged his fans to file claims, 72 of them did just that. And I guess because it was filed in California, Patreon has to pay the arbitration filing fees up front on each separate case and other legal fees. Altogether, this could cost them as much as 20 million bucks. That's even before the outcome of the case. Patreon could very much probably not survive that. And those words actually come from the legendary G. Edward Griffin, as of course everything we say and play will all be of course included. Links in the show notes. We've got the PDF to Patreon's injunction against Owen Benjamin and their backers, of course, denied. And James, I've been, you know this, you and I have talked about this. We've talked about this off, off camera, off mic. I've been saying for a while, but I say it off camera because I don't want to get punished. I don't want to get deplatformed. I'm pretty small in the alternative media pond and that would hurt me pretty hardcore. But what I've basically been saying privately to, to friends and colleagues, Patreon, man, they are snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. They've pretty much owned the crowdfund platform game. But if, to me, it's just they've run it into the ground with updates no one asked for. Meanwhile, the things that people want and have asked for, like getting an email when someone cancels, they won't do it. They steadfastly refuse to do it. They want you to keep coming back to their website so if you're, of course, dependent on their platform. The other changes they've made, they seem really interested and they've made lots of changes behind the scenes on what you can do with your tiers and your levels as a creator. James, I don't know if you've noticed this. I think you've said you really don't spend much time on there at all. You just have it as another avenue of any number of ways, and we don't care how, but that people support independent ad-free alternative media. They've gotten into this whole thing where they want creators to sell all their tchotchkes and shirts, and I'm sure, of course, they're made very responsibly. 
And basically all this sucks because now they're probably going to get destroyed in this court case, as they probably should. But what's going to happen? They're going to get bought up by Amazon or Apple or some other horrible place. And guess what? They ain't in it for the neat crowdfunding platform. Like everything, they want all that sweet, sweet personal data. James. This is how this game works, because it is a game of international finance. Any any player like this that is going to be able to essentially operate like a bank or work with the banking regulations of multiple countries all around the world, they are, by definition, going to be part of the problem. They are going to be involved in this system in some way. That's just, it, they would not be allowed to operate the way they do. That, of course, goes for PayPal. It, of course, goes for Patreon. So they are going to be very, uh, shall we say, problematic platforms uh, for people who are interested in independence. But then the other side of that coin, I, I mean, at the very least, you are in the United States. A lot of your listeners are in the United States. You at least have the option of a P.O. box where people can send you cash and checks and what have you. Well, I'm in Japan. The 99.9% .9 of my audience is spread all around the globe and has to, if they send money, it's going to have to come internationally through the channels, the controlled channels like a Patreon or a PayPal or whatever. So it's, uh, it's very much a catch-22 and might be very much a losing situation. But having said that, this is a positive story insofar as, yes, Patreon does deserve to be punished for what they're doing, deplatforming people um, in violation of their own terms, as is being proven out in the court system or is about to be. Um, but of course, what does that mean for the genuine possibility of crowdsourcing information like this and what are the long-term ramifications, it's uh, its a big mess. Um, but that's the way it's designed to be. I mean, international finance is, of course, a controlled game, and you're going to have to be a controlled player if you're going to provide some sort of service like this that acts as some sort of quasi-international bank. Uh, you better believe these are the, well, in PayPal's case, literally the people who go to Bilderberg, right? So this is this is the game that's being played right now. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, is I wish Patreon functioned half as well and quickly as friggin' PayPal does. Mm. James, I think we can probably talk a little bit more about this in ways, you know, you might support independent alternative media at the end of this episode. Our third and final story on this episode 417 in New World next week, pretty related to story number two. They are, I think, you know, it's all part and parcel, James. Sobering report shows hardening attitudes against media. This coming from the Associated Press. The distrust many Americans feel towards the news media caught up like much of the nation's problems in the partisan divide is only getting worse. That was the conclusion of a sobering study of attitudes towards the press conducted by the Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, Knight Foundation in Gallup and released just couple days just yesterday. Nearly half of all Americans described the news media as very biased. The survey found, and John Sands, director of learning and impact at the Knight Foundation, said, that's a bad thing for democracy. Our concern is that when half of Americans have some sort of doubt about the veracity of the news they consume, it's going to be impossible for our democracy to function. The study was conducted before the scamdemic and before the Super George Floyd freakout. I can only imagine what it would be like now. 71% of fake conservatives have a very or somewhat unfavorable opinion of the news media, while 22% of fake progressives felt the same way. Those surveyed also didn't believe much in honest mistakes, while there were inaccuracies in articles or when there were inaccuracies in articles, I should say, 54% of Americans believed reporters misrepresented the facts, while 28% said they were making up things in their entirety. You know, maybe like from the Incubator Baby story to just, and again, James, I, I thought about we could have done a back and forth of just reeling off all the things known publicly, obviously, admittedly lies. Remember? Dateline NBC rigged a truck to explode, so it looked even more dramatic, and of course they lost big time in court and in the public court. Knight and Gallup conducted a random sample of 20,046 American adults between November 8th, 2019 and February 16th, 2020, and of course the margin of error plus one minus percent will include yet another PDF link for you, Perceived Accuracy and Bias in the News Media, a Gallup Knight Foundation survey and James, this one, this was this was news to you, I think, in really, really related news. Uh, someone I'm not, I'm not familiar with their name, Ariana Pekari, P-E-K-A-R-Y. She just posted to, of course, 
her own website? Not on some Zuckerberg Gates platform? Huh. Why I'm leaving MSNBC, this cancer stokes national division. And so the really interesting thing, before I throw it back to you, James, they like to use the words at the same time, kind of like I think we were one of the first outlets to tell you they're going to start talking about the Great Reset. Watch for these words. It's coming. To bring it full circle, I suppose, World Health Organization issues sobering warning, saying there may never be a coronavirus vaccine that works properly. James. Interesting. Well, for people who are new to New World Next Week, you may not know, but we cover this story as almost every year. I don't know if we did it last year, but pretty much every year of New World Next Week, we there's around the fall, there's usually a media trust survey, and we generally cover it. And we generally, I mean, we have literally charted over the decade that we've been doing this, how trust in TV and newspapers has been declining and trust in internet, uh, online independent information has been increasing. And here we go again. Yes, even fewer people are trusting what they see the talking head liars in the mainstream media saying, for good reason, as you point out, time after time after time. Hey, I mean, Nicholas Sandman just uh, concluded his, or some, a couple of his um, uh, lawsuits. I, I don't think that it's all of them, but at any rate, has received some undisclosed sum for the fact that the uh, media lied brazenly about that incident. If you need more on that, you can see my previous uh, fake news awards where I did talk about that incident. But I mean, yeah, the, the examples are numerous, and I'm sure we could regale each other for for hours about them. And yes, the public is noticing. I, I, this is not, this is two plus two equals four stuff. This is very, very basic and uh, it shouldn't be surprising, but it is still a hopeful thing. And we should keep that in mind. Yes. Don't worry. You are not alone. Many, many, many people around you also see through the lies and understand them to be lies. That is a positive and hopeful thing. And as I say, we still need to continue pushing this information out and making people understand. I think probably the most important part of all of this is the social proof. You are not alone. There are other people who are questioning what's going on. You do not have to feel crazy or out there on a limb if you question anything. No, there's many, many, many people around you who are doing the same. So uh, I think we we all have to enact in our life the creating the safe space, to use that, that terminology, for people to come out of the closet as conspiracy-minded. Oh, you don't trust everything that the mainstream media believes? Oh, what a crazy... Uh, oh, well, actually, I don't either. <laughs> and then that, that can open up the space for those kinds of conversations. So, uh, again, this is a hopeful thing, and it just shows, once again, there are more people out there that are questioning than the establishment will ever tell you, because the revolution will not be televised, it will not be YouTubed, it will not be on any mainstream controlled platform. Well, and I mean, there's a great example of essentially the, the lies and the how many people protested in Berlin last week. Holy smokes. And again, they either would not cover it at all or basically lied about the news. Like, yeah, it's a couple thousand people. It was a lot, a lot, Exactly. A lot. That's a great point. And thank you for bringing that up. I did want to bring that up specifically because, as you say, they said there was maybe 10,000, maybe 20,000 far-right fringe people. Meanwhile, you know, you've got a million people out on the streets, ordinary Germans, absolutely incensed about what's going on. And they know they have now every single one of those people in that protest have experienced the lies, the smears of the establishment press. They know what this is about. And uh, that's the kind of thing you've got. You have to beggar. It beggars your imagination that the mainstream media believes that they can still control reality like that in this age, that they can just say, ah, oh, there was a few thousand fringe nutballs out there. Meanwhile, you know, a significant percentage of the German population were out on the streets and they know that the uh, establishment media is lying about that. I enjoy hearing you say what I'm pretty sure are words you maybe got from me, like nutballs. <laughs> well, James, that's gonna, I mean, and it's this is all gonna come to Melbourne here in like three, two, one. So the last couple of bits here before we wrap up, I think another important episode of New World Next Week. James, two plus two equals five has actually been trending on Twitter recently. See, you're missing you're missing the dumpster fire of Twitter, man. Uh, I, have, of course, have covered the Nicholas Sandman stories. It is two down, six to go. CNN caved, Washington Post caved. Uh, is that everything? I think that's everything, James. I was going to mention, of course, all the ways that people can support us. So, a couple years ago, the big Patreon purge. 
people stopped supporting us in, of course, protest against Patreon, but all that did, of course, was hurt independent, commercial-free folks like, like you and I. James, again, we've got any number of platforms. I've got PayPal, I've got Patreon, I've got Subscribestar, I've got Stripe, I've got cryptocurrency, and I've got, like you said, the post office box. And I've definitely seen an increase in folks sending cash and precious metals via the post office box. So speaking of presence in the P.O. Box, James, I will mention that as I've pretty much always done in all the years past in the Media Monarchy Kingdom, next week is my birthday. So I'm actually going to take next week off from broadcasting. And what, you're taking off in honor of my birthday as well? Yeah, something like that. Well, we're going on a little family camping trip, so it all works out. All right, buddy. So we'll be off next week, which, of course, everybody would think that, oh, that means the world's going to explode. They always want you to think the world is going to explode. And again, I think if we sort of say safe and stay sane and stay rational, we can, I think, see ourselves through this. Hopefully, like we've seen ourselves through things before. James, I appreciate you, buddy. All right. Well, we'll see you in two weeks. All right. Take care.